The Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency's Hunter Education Program has certified over three quarters of a million students. Our volunteer instructors have made Tennessee one of the safest states in America to hunt. To find out about classes scheduled in your area, log on to tnwildlife.org. On this episode of Tennessee Outdoor Journal, we'll go tracking an elk on North Cumberland Wildlife Management Area on the first archery-only elk hunt. We'll go visit Flintville Fish Hatchery as they prepare to deliver rainbow trout to a local fishing hole. Next, it's time to head down to the Wilson County Fairgrounds to draw for a duck blind. Talk about tradition. Then we'll go visit TWRA at the Murray County Fair, where they've brought along some Duck River natives to show off to the public. We'll round up some geese near Old Hickory Lake. We'll band them and formulate a population estimate. And finally, TWRA throws a remotely operated vehicle in the water in hope of some help with a boating investigation. Tennessee Outdoor Journal is opening the cover and inviting you in for a behind the scenes look at the work being done every day by your Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. Let's turn the page. What kind of legacy will we leave when our days upon this earth are gone? Tell me who will carry on this work that we've begun. Care enough to be the keeper of the dream. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Tennessee Outdoor Journal. Our first story today takes us to the field for the first archery-only elk hunt. So this is a really special hunt. It's a unique hunt. Um, well, I, I heard about it when they first started up. I was uh, really uh, happy to hear that they were going to start an elk hunt up, and I started applying immediately. And when I saw the bow hunt, it, it was that, that's who I am. I love to bow hunt. You know, being able to, to call in an 800 pound bull to archery range is just a, a phenomenal opportunity. I'm used to rugged country. I'm used to hunting on hills and stuff, but I didn't know we were hunting in hills like Kentucky has. <laughs> it, it was pretty rugged. I was wore out after day one. It wasn't so bad going in. Everything was downhill, uh, going through field after field and down the down the hills and things, but boy, when we started out, after the first hill, I was, I was pretty much zapped. <laughs> East Tennessee elk hunting, just like uh, any type of hunting, deer, especially turkey, any animal that you're trying to call, you have to locate them first. And up here, we don't have a lot of fields that the elk are using right now. The challenging thing, with hunting elk on this management area is the terrain, right? It is so steep and it's kind of like turkey hunting. You may hear a bull bugle, but getting there is, is tough. Um, you know, and because of the terrain, we're not able to put in these huge expansive fields like you might see in, in the west where you see elk in meadows and stuff. And we just don't have many flat spaces to do that. Um, but the elk are bugling pretty good right now. Um, they're kind of keying in, seem to be on acorns a little bit. Um, we're seeing them some in fields. Um, this lack of rain has, has sort of harmed some of our uh, initial field establishment with our, our winter food plots, but and hopefully we'll have a, a successful um, hunt by the time it's over. But we're close enough to hear it if there's anything up on this ridge. The elk were not where they're supposed to be, and you know, they don't always get the the calling card and they don't know when to show up and where to show up. So we're back in the timber. We're looking for sign on the ground, trying to find an animal that is not talking to you in the middle of all this big timber. It's uh, it's quite daunting task uh, just to even locate them. 
after morning day two, it was real discouraging, you know. Uh, for me, it was a, it's pretty disappointing, you know. You draw a large piece of land and you can't pinpoint them. So we're literally hunting a turkey with horns that can smell you. And that's what we're up here uh, trying to do. Uh, where we're hunting right now, we're walking in two miles in and two miles back out. So we're in here and so are the animals. We just have to stay with it. Yeah, at the end of second day, God did his job and put us where, where we needed to be. A bull must have stood up and let out a you know, wake up bugle. And that, that was unlike any experience I've ever felt in my life. It, it, was, it was nice. There's a bench right here when I was standing there that kind of comes up at an angle that way. The moment of truth and the elk answers you. Nothing can prepare you. Uh, no matter how many hunts you've been on, nobody uh, has the constitution to stand there and be stone-faced when it, when it happens. There's a bull right there. Get on that tree, get behind the tree, see bees around it. There's a bull right there. It happened so quick. Uh, it's hard to describe what was going through my mind. <laughs> it, it was sort of like uh, your first deer, except for more, more exciting. Oh my gosh, there's another one coming from our left. Oh my God. Things did come together, but uh, didn't play out the way it should have. Oh my God, I just missed. No matter where you've hunted in the world, no matter what you've done, having a bull elk come into you at uh, bow range is just unnerving. And that's just all I can say. I mean, it's terrifying. Oh, shoot. Yeah, it's everything I thought it would be. And truthfully, you know, the having the bull you know, in my sights, two, not one, but two. That, that made everything, you know. And I think this is, you know, a great hunt. Glad they put it on. Hope they continue. Maybe in the future we'll see more, uh, more and more hunters be able to come out here and enjoy what I enjoyed. It's always tough to predict um, what a population will do over time, but, you know, I think it will continue to grow, um, especially as we, we make some more management decisions that put more uh, quality elk forage out on the landscape and we can get you know, better nutrition, better calf production um, and the recruitment into the population. So, you know, ultimately, you know, maybe in the future we'll have more tags and, and more hunters can come and, and enjoy this, uh, this resource we now have. Next up, Flintville Fish Hatchery, winter trout stocking. So this is the Flintmore Fish Hatchery. On the release days, we stay pretty busy. Our stream crews goes out and surveys the stream and they'll come up with a number of trout that uh, they think we could use in that stream and uh, we'll go with it. And sometimes we have to tweak it a little. A lot of it depends on fishing pressure. Hatchery was built in 30 and 31. Originally built by the federal government and uh, wildlife took it over sometime in the 40s. We've been putting out the trout ever since. We, we usually run around 120,000 a year adult fish. And uh, for years we raised like 250,000. Like I say 120,000 a year, so it, they add up pretty quick. Millions and millions over the years, all rainbow. That's all we raise at, on this side. Yesterday, we left them off feed. This morning, we'll come in, we'll, we'll water our trucks, get our numbers off the charts what we got to have for that particular stream for that day. We go down and uh, screen the fish down. We've got a loader truck that we reach in and get the fish with and it actually weighs them as it's picking the fish up. We go by, by that weight, how many numbers of fish we've got. He'll swing it over the truck, pull a pin and, and dump it into the water. Then we'll haul them to the stream. 
The winter trout stocking uh, program is just uh, to provide fishing opportunities that otherwise would not exist. We stock a lot of uh, metropolitan urban areas where there are a lot of potential anglers and it gives them uh, opportunities to come out rather than just traditional uh, spring, summer, fall, they're able to continue fishing through the winter. It increases uh, catch rates and provides another species. You know, so many people love to fish for trout. So uh, that is the uh, main goal is just to uh, keep fi people fishing year round and provide more opportunities in these urban areas. Start. Our next story is about drawing for ducks and the tradition of it all. Well, okay, we got 69, 71, 81, 82, 19, 18, and 17. Just go ahead and show me some ID because you don't look nothing like Kobe Bryant. I just retired. I... <laughs> this is our annual duck blind drawing. For as long as I can remember, we've always held it right here at Wilson County Fairgrounds. This site right here is just Old Hickory, but all the blind drawings all across the state is today. It's the first Saturday in August. It's pretty awesome. It's a pretty unique atmosphere having everyone together like this. And kind of a, a gathering of you know duck hunters early in the season. We don't get anything like this, you know, where we're from originally. So it's kind of a unique environment. Yeah, it is. It's terrific. There was talks at one time to put it on a computer draw, and I, I think we got a lot of negative feedback on that because they they like to come out and uh, you know make it into an event. We think of different seasons like squirrel season as the beginning of the hunting season, but I, th I think a lot of these people that show up here, this kicks off their season. 33, 35, 37, 39. Good blind, good blind. Y'all done a good job this year, except planting. Rodney needs to be fired. <laughs> <laughs> come here. Come here. We ain't editing nothing. This is the here, man, Rodney. Come around here, Rodney. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's looking, hey, yeah. <laughs> This is the one time where the agency folks, who by the way are mega outdoorsmen, are coming out with, with the, the sportsmen of the state of Tennessee, and we get to meet with them face to face. And this happens in uh, all over the state of Tennessee, really, but for here it's very special for us. It's been going on for decades. It's kind of a big day for all the duck hunters, especially in this area. It's gotta be one of the food hall spots, for sure. Maybe yeah. something on the uh, upper end, like zero or four, probably. That's the current plan. We'll adjust as we go along. They're looking at the food, they're looking at the blinds, and you know, seeing what condition everything is. Yep. The process is, is they put their name in, and then it's just like a just a like a door prize drawing. We put it in a drum, we spin it, we pull the name out of the hat. And we call them up and then they bring all their people in and we sign them on and they get their blind permits and then they're good to go for that. They hold that blind for the entire season. First rule number one, get drawn, then we'll go from there. <laughs> we've got 88 blinds in unit one and then we've got 44 blinds in unit two. The corn is fair but we did get almost 100 acres of millet on top of that and the millet grows really well in wet conditions and it's coming on pretty good so as long as we get the weather to push the ducks south we should hold ducks during the season. This is a time when everybody that comes in here, most of the people that are here have either lifetime licenses or they have or they have Type 04 sportsman license. And uh, so it's unique. It's a unique little niche that we have in the agency. It's tradition. There's no question about it. This has been going on so long. It is a part of the agency. And I know it's hot. This is always August, first Saturday in August. It's hot, but everybody comes out here and we all have a good time and we love it. Line 18 for Ryan Good. They know they're going to see people they haven't seen since last year's duck blind on. And they, you just see them get in the group and they're just talking and out their experiences. And the children are around them, the younger people are around them, and they're listening to this. And it's, the excitement is contagious, there's no question about it. We've really worked our butts off this year. We've worked up every square inch that we possibly could in our duck ponds, planting, you know, everything from corn to millet and milo. And uh, we just wait for the 
food to cure out so that we can put water on it this fall and flood all of our fields and uh, wait, on, wait on the ducks. Hey, let's go to the Murray County Fair and see some outreach from TWRA staff. Murray County Fair comes around once a year. It's usually the second to third weekend of August, uh, and it runs about five to six days. And you know what that one is? What does it look like? It's pretty smelly when you smell it. <laughs> Scum. Yep. It is We've had a booth for about the last four years now. Um, we take that time to, to meet and greet a lot of Murray County residents, some from other counties come to the fair. We're set up on your way in the fair, so we get a lot of people that are coming in. They, they really enjoy seeing some of the wildlife that we have. Is that the truck? Look, catfish. Catfish. Yep, that's the catfish. We put a fish tank up. Uh, we catch native fish from the Duck River the week of the fair. Here we go. about the only time of the year that, that us as officers get to shock fish anymore, so we go out, we'll shock some fish up. It's hard work and it's hot weather, so it um, gives us a little bit more respect for our fish guys that do it every day. We'll shock right through here for now. Another catfish. It's kind of fast-paced action. You know, as the fish comes up, you got to reach in and grab it with the net uh, pretty quick. And if you if you're just a little bit too late and you miss that fish, and you know, you might have missed your great opportunity to catch something that that we didn't have. We try to get a good variety of everything that way people can see what's in the Duck River right here. People have a, a different mindset about the Duck River. It doesn't have that crystal clear, pristine water look to it. It's kind of always dingy. Uh, we often call it the muddy duck, and that's its natural color. Um, but it, people associate that dinge with a lot of times bad stuff, uh, and this helps them realize that it's very diverse. Like I said, it's one of the most d diverse rivers in, in North America. Um, got the most amount of species, got a lot of endangered mussels, a ton of other mussels, a um, lot of different different creatures live in there for sure. So helps uh, helps us show them what's what's right here in their home county. I want a fish. Everybody that comes through here just seems to love the, the fish tank. We have a lot of people that just traverse back and forth through the building. Um, and a lot of times when the kids see it, they just flock to it automatically. And then the parents, you know, have to stay with the kids so they're following them and uh, we get to talking about it. That's that's probably one of the smaller garter we, we shocked up today. And there were several you know, a lot of those fish too that they've never seen before and they when we tell them that they come out of the Duck River, they never would associate that many fish being in the Duck River or, or you know, being as diverse as, as it is. We see a little bit of everybody. A lot of time the kids will come over, look at the fish, uh, but then that their parent may have a question. They've been waiting a year or five years to ask a game warden in person. So that's, we're sitting there, we answer a lot of questions, we give out a lot of materials, um, hunting fishing guides, give out business cards, answer any kind of questions. Uh, you may have law enforcement or wildlife related. We look at uh, a lot of trail camera pics, hear a lot of hunting stories, a lot of fishing stories, and it's just a great way to interact with the public. Our next story is about a goose roundup. get the geese off the lake into this pen so we can uh, bring them in, band them, assign gender, age them, and then we'll release them back out. I see a bunch there in the slough. Is anybody over there to work them up this way? We have to do it for the feds to have our early goose season, resident goose season. I've got one kayaker. If we had the other one, it helped. Yeah, I see one right here. I'll send him up to the back of the slough. Back in the, if I'm not mistaken, in the 70s, some juvenile Canada geese were brought down to Old Hickory Lake. And waterfowl tend to go back to wherever they're raised to have their young. And since those were raised here, over time, resident birds have grown, the flock has grown. And once we decided we wanted to go ahead and hunt those birds, 
then the feds required us to maintain some kind of record on what the size of the population is so that we don't over harvest. And that's what this is doing. This is going to go ahead and tell us how many of the banded birds that we recapture will give us some idea on what the population size is. Tell you what's going on is this time of year the geese are molting, they're losing their feathers. Waterfowl traditionally molts their wing feathers, their flight feathers, and they do that when they have their young. I think that's nature's way of keeping the mama on the ground, protecting the young. Uh, you always have a few that still have a few flight feathers that get away from us, but we'll take the boats, the kayaks, and we'll round them up on the lake. We'll push them up to this point, and they'll walk right up here, and we'll put them in a pan, and they'll sit here until we're finished with them. All right, we'll get them in the pan. First thing we do is we look for any birds that have already got bands on them. Right here, Brad. This one right here. That one right there. That one? Yep. Here you go, James. We record those bands because those are the ones that we can use to estimate population. <laughs> one, one, three, eight, day, one, two, oh, six, six. Got it. And then if there are any juveniles, we'll separate the juveniles out so they don't get trampled. And uh, then we'll go ahead, those birds that are banded, we record. Then we'll go through the adults. We go ahead and sex. <laughs> Male. Male. We go ahead and band them, record that, and turn that back into the federal government. And then we'll do the juvenile birds. We'll go ahead and band those. Most of those are plenty big enough to, to put bands on that'll stay. It's just an, it's another season, another opportunity, and that's what our agency is about, an opportunity. Of course, we can't hunt here, but we can hunt in the general vicinity, which knocks some of the population down, so maybe there's just not that many birds that create a mess. Uh, sometimes the feds have to come in and other times of the year and, and capture some if they become a real nuisance. But this is just to control the size of the population of resident birds. So they, they just go back on their way. It doesn't affect them a bit. So, uh, they go back on their way and do what geese do, make a lot of mess. <laughs> we'll finish off this episode with a boating investigation story april you know the weather starts to warm up starts to get pretty you get a lot of fishermen you don't get a, a, a ton of pleasure boaters right now you know starting about may warms up a little bit more uh, you get a lot of a lot of people out skiing uh you know sea dudes um, personal watercraft everything Right now we've got a missing person here on Priest and we've got OEM out here as well as some of our guys with TWRA. As far as we understand, there was three individuals on, the, uh, on board, on the canoes, and there were three life jackets. When they left out, they indicated that the, the waters were pretty calm. Um, they weren't having any trouble and as the day progressed, the conditions changed, the wind got up. Um, all of the parties, all three of them, transitioned into one boat instead of two. And then the waves and the wind were really high, ultimately capsizing the canoe that they were in. OEM has uh, a couple of dogs they use in body recovery. And they've hit a couple of times out here um, where we believe uh, the individual uh, may have gone down. You know, any, any time they hit, if OEM sees anything on their side imaging, or if the dogs hit, uh, we're gonna come over and, uh, and use the ROV and see if we can find something. It's a very technical piece of equipment. Uh, there's, I'd say, three main things that we're looking at. We have sonar built in on the ROV itself, and it's ultimately like shining a flashlight underwater on the bottom of the lake bed. We can plot points that uh, are of interest to us. We can mark things such as evidence or where we recover evidence or people. And additionally, we have a camera on board that we can take photographs uh, and take video. It's, for lack of better terms, like a little bitty sub with a camera on it. And he's controlling it with a joystick over there. And it's, it's tethered to a cable which runs to to their equipment and he's looking at his laptop and anything that the ROV sees, you know, he can he can see. And you know the reality is is most people think they're a good swimmer and many of them are, but they encounter situations where they're all of a sudden end up in the water and they don't expect to be. The water is cold, they're not dressed to be in the water, they've got on many clothes such as hunting apparel or waders and they don't anticipate being in the water and all of a sudden they are and now they have to swim and sometimes they may be in the middle of a lake 
or they may be in a very uh, current ridden river and they just can't overcome that. They may be a good swimmer in a nice warm pool in the middle of the summer, but many of the situations that our sportsmen get into out here on our waterways are not very conducive to swimming in the gear they have on and the environments that they fish and hunt in. I couldn't imagine standing on the riverbank with my family member missing for days and days at a time and trying to go home and sleep and carrying on a normal life. So. Uh, that's the reason myself and our other investigators, our other boating officers, will come out at all hours of the day and night and use this piece of equipment to try to bring closure to these families that have been involved in these incidents on our waterways. What's the one thing you want people to bring to the lake? You know, and I would always say common sense uh, because people get out here and there's no speed limits, there's no stop signs, and people sometimes lose sense of speed and direction of travel and they want to just go and have fun and forget about things that may happen. Slow down, bring common sense, have a good time, but be safe. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Tennessee Outdoor Journal. We'll see you next time. Tennessee Outdoor Journal is produced by your Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. Tell me who will carry on this work that we've begun. Care enough to be the keeper of the dream. This legacy. Our legacy. Hey Tennessee, I'm Kix Brooks. You know, I've been blessed to tour this nation from sea to shining sea. And every time that bus rolls back across the state line, I'm reminded how good we have it here in our home state. Whether you like to hunt, fish, or watch wildlife, we got our Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency to thank for it. But before you follow that red dirt road to your favorite fishing hole or hunting spot, there's one thing you need, a license. Just visit GoOutdoorsTennessee.com and you can get your license in minutes. Hi, I'm Charlie Daniels. When I was a kid, I loved baseball and football and all kind of stuff, but my favorite pastime was when my daddy would get me up early in the morning, we'd go hunting or fishing. Out in the fresh air, on the water, or back in the woods, and you learn a lot. You got kids, take them hunting, take them fishing. Join me, buy a hunting or fishing license. Let's keep wildlife in Tennessee. That's a doggone good thing. Buy your license today at GoOutdoorsTennessee.com. Hi, I'm Tracy Lawrence, just letting you know that the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency supports itself and manages all of the state's wildlife with the dollars invested by hunters and fishermen when they buy licenses. If you've never bought a license, but appreciate the abundant wildlife we enjoy in this state, I encourage you to do it. Start with the Type 01. It's a great investment in Tennessee wildlife. Learn more at tnwildlife.org. Buy your license today at GoOutdoorsTennessee.com.